welcome to the From Survivor to Thriver podcast. I'm Mark Fernandes. Each week, along with my co-host Eric DeRosa, we aim to shatter the stigma around mental health conversations through kitchen table conversations with real and relatable people, all the while reminding our audience that they are not alone. There is hope, there is help, and there is a way through. Enjoy today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to From Survivor to Thriver, episode 87. This is Mark Fernandes, your co-host, and I'm going to do this quick because it's crazy and I have to do two out of the three. We're not going to do the numerology today. Again, it has a lot to do with like strength and individuality. It, it's the same. So first thing, sports figures, 87. It seems like we're going north, so this is going to make sense because both of these guys are right on the Canadian-U.S. border. I'm watching... Eric <laughs> make his, uh, he already knows probably the two guys I'm going to mention. There are tons of guys that have worn 87 in many sports that deserve mentioning, but I'm going to pick my two favorites and go with it. So we're going to go with hockey first, and we got to talk about him, even though he plays for one of my least favorite teams, and I think he's kind of a whining baby early in his career, but he has matured well. Sid the Kid, Sidney Crosby, truly one of the most skilled hockey players to ever play the game, and that's really hard for me to say out loud. And then... Coming south of the border to where he grew up in Buffalo, New York, Rob Gronkowski, who I have no issue saying the greatest modern NFL tight end. That's right. And a guy I've met, and he's for real, that giant toddler you see running around in that giant man body, that's that guy. It's really cool. So, and then I have to eat crow again, because I don't hate 80s music, even though I like to say how much I hate 80s music. Because in my opinion, one of the you said five. I'd actually put it in my top three. One of the top three hard rock albums of all time came out in 1987. Appetite for Destruction by Guns N' Roses. Now, again, I'm eating crow and Eric is enjoying this because I so I have to go through this list because Eric's like, there's only one album that matters in 1987. Not true. Check this out. Sign of the Times by Prince. It, in my opinion, his second best album, because I do think Purple Rain is his best, but another great one. I'm a huge fan of Sonic Youth. Sister came out in 1987. Bruce Springsteen, in his pop turn, Tunnel of Love came out in 1987. Not sure that's an album he's proud of, but he, it did lead to a ton of success for him. Uh, U2's The Joshua Tree. I, I, it's it's like a murderer's row. And even stuff that I don't really love, Music for the Masses by Depeche Mode came out in 1987. And that's an homage to my wife and Eric, who loved Depeche and loved that album. Um, and I have to do it. Now, we're going to go old school hip hop. Cool Modi's How You Like Me Now came out in 1987. A lot of you who are younger than us may not know that album, but you have heard thousands of samples of that album in other songs, including stuff that's come out this year. And then we get... Even this, which I'm not a huge country fan, but this is a great album. King's Record Shop by Roseanne Cash came out in 1987. And if you don't know who Roseanne Cash is, look her up. She's also related to George Clooney. It's a cool story. This one's for you, Eric. Def Leppard's Hysteria. Michael Jackson's Bad. I mean, it's literally a murderer's row. George Michael's Faith. Midnight Oil's Diesel and Dust, which is an amazing album. Like, everyone knows a couple of those songs, but listen to that whole album. It's awesome. And then another shout-out to my wife. The Cure's Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me came out in 1987. We're going to do two more because one of them is just really funny. If you haven't delved into the old-school, weird, like, New York uh, hip-hop scene of the 80s, Fat Boy's Crushin' came out in 1987. And if you haven't listened to that, give it a listen, and I can tell you for sure that album could not be made today. The, that would get canceled in a second. And then, just because she just recently, it's really cool that the name of this album is recently, and she has sort of come back to the forefront again because her music is so incredible, Joan Baez uh, in 1987 recently came out. So I have to stop saying I hate 80s music. So we're going to throw it across the creek so he can take his victory lap on my opinions. Eric DeRosa, how are we today? Good morning. No, I'm not going to take any victory laps. I'm only going to talk about two of those albums, though. First, <laughs> I just want to say that was what I consider to be U2's last album, right? Cause, sure, cause, sure. Yeah, yeah, early U2 fans, that's, yeah, that, that's... Because after Joshua Tree, it became Rattle and Hum, and then I, I never recognized the band again uh, from there. But uh, love, love, love Joshua Tree. And yes, Appetite changed... For me, the music landscape, it was 
in between my sophomore and junior in high school. And I just remember all my friends walking around with their denim jackets, with the big uh, patches of Guns N' Roses on the back and the concert t-shirts. And And the uh, headband. And as you know, Slash is one of my favorite guitarists uh of all time and probably one of the nicest nicest people yeah uh, he's, you'll, he's a great dude you'll ever get a chance to meet so very very cool but it's uh everything's good over here we're slowly starting to move towards your favorite skis and skis i saw somebody post this morning 100, 100 days, days to opening day 100 days to opening day of skis which season, means so. i'll i'll be on snow probably in 70 ish it's beautiful here. I was talking to our guests right before we came on, and I know the weather where she is. Uh, we were talking about how great it is. No uh, wildfires this summer anywhere where we live, and beautiful, clean air. It's beautiful up in the mountains, both here and where we're going to see our, our guests today. It's like we've traded weather with the UK. Yes. They're yes. hot and dry, and we are decidedly British in our weather. Yes, recently. but... <laughs> Given what's going on here in the last eight years, I think we'll take it's, it. Well, it's yeah, it's it's well earned and well deserved, and it's it's quite pretty to look at. But enough of us. Let's go. Let's go north again to Kelowna. For our audience who's not familiar with Canadian geography, they call it the Horseshoe. I think Fernie's up there. Revelstoke is up there. Some of the coolest ski resorts, and and I'm sure our guests will. Fill us in. It's uh, somewhere, I think, north of kind of Montana-ish, if our U.S.-centric based audience uh, is trying to figure out their Canadian geography. But with that, joining us today is Krista Francoeur, known for her ability to create beauty in everything she sees. Krista, the founder and CEO of Wild Remedies, is a modern magic maven who uses her lessons of karmic suffering and her body, mind, and spirit to facilitate healing, awareness, and balance in every area of her life. After spending a large part of her life battling chronic illness, inflammation, and self-sabotaging behaviors, she incorporated the conscious use of mindfulness, mysticism, and introspection to help uncover the answers that were always there within herself. Harnessing these energies, although difficult, has guided her through an amazing journey of thousands of hours of research, spiritual, and self-exploration that has reconnected her with the creative and magical nature of herself and of all women. Through the use of education, plant medicine, botanicals, and ancient wisdom, she hopes to help other women reconnect with themselves so they too can consciously utilize energies to heal imbalances and reignite the beauty and magic in their own lives. With that, let's go north of the border. Let's welcome in Krista. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you so much for having me, you guys. I'm super psyched to be here. So magic in your the way you describe yourself and in and in your email you spell it differently than we would normally see magic. There's a CK at the end. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? Magic with a CK is just, it's a little bit more witchy. It's (laughs) the way that, you know, it was kind of spelled back in the day when we were referring more to like witchcraft and those types of things. And I just, I I wanted to, I I kind of wanted to bring that word back. Like we literally have it on our packaging. We create these products called magic lattes and I spell it with a CK and you know, it's a little bit edgy, but I feel like it's a word that kind of needs to be reclaimed because a witch back in the day was really just someone who, you know, was a, a plant medicine healer or, you know, a midwife. And through that period of witch burning and all of these things that that, that happened all of those years ago, the power from those types of healing modalities was really stolen from, from the feminine. And there's kind of like this really big resurgence that's happening with those words. And I just wanted to kind of bring that to the forefront. It makes so much sense. And, I, and I'll be honest, my understanding or knowledge of a lot of this stuff didn't really come to the forefront until in college studying uh, the play, The Crucible, which is all about the Salem witch trials. And one of the things that Arthur Miller, I won't say avoided, but he tried to show this idea of like, it really was sort of the divine feminine, right? These people that were considered witches were 
healers. They were people who used plants and medicine. And really what it came down to is they didn't ascribe to this puritanical idea of Christianity and the church. They offered alternative means of healing and understanding what was happening to them. And obviously, we're also talking about a play that was written in the 50s, which was, you know, we look at The Crucible now as just like part of the American theater canon, but it was hugely controversial at the time because it didn't take a negative view of said witches. Uh, I just use the air quotes for those of you listening. Um, and and I think it's interesting because like when I think of magic with a K, you know, unfortunately, the word that comes to mind is archaic, right? It's an ancient spelling. It's a it's a spelling we don't use anymore. And one of the things that we've sort of learned in our journey, 87, 87 episodes into this thing, is how often we have actually lost touch with or have lost a thought and an understanding, whether it's a split between Western and Eastern medicine, being more respectful of sort of science and chemistry versus this sort of like long-term knowledge of like, yeah, if you don't feel good, maybe you should just like sit in the sun for an hour, <laughs> you know? And like, and and is that magic? Yes, actually, because it works. And, and really, that's what it comes down to. I, I think one of the coolest expressions of what magic means, and I'm forgetting who said it, actually has to do with like science and technology. And it's like, look, technology or something that works in a certain way to someone who doesn't understand the background of it always looks like magic. You know, if you had seen a plane fly for the first time and had no knowledge of aeronautics, you're like, yeah, that's magic. Right. Or, and luckily we could see that through a child's eyes. Um, but we've sort of lost touch with that. And, and I wonder what brought you to that point where you realized that you needed to get back in touch with those things that we had lost. Well, it's interesting. Like when I started on my, I guess my healing journey, one of the first things that I was introduced to, I mean, I was kind of at that point where, you know, you're in the dark, you feel like things are happening to you, you don't have control of your life. I remember watching The Secret for the first time, right? And so all of this new age stuff is quite big now. And the concept of the law of attraction is, it's pretty commonplace, right? Like everybody's talking about manifesting stuff. And so when I first delved into this, I really went from like a science perspective. So I was reading a lot of like quantum physics and that sort of stuff. And that's kind of what my brain needed in the beginning, going from a place of like, you know, I guess being divided from from spirit at that point. I didn't really feel like that was something that was real or, you know, I just really didn't have a lot of experience in it. So I kind of started there. But then as I kind of dove into it, I really got curious with, you know, the the meshing of the science and the spirituality. And it just became very apparent to me that like, you know, magic or a spell or something to that effect is really just the law of attraction, right? And so when you think of like alchemy or internal alchemy, and if you're doing like, you know, a spell of some sort or a specific type of meditation where you are just adding a lot of intention in order to bring something about in your life, that's really all it is, right? So like law of attraction is, you know, thinking a certain way, you've got like your vision boards and all this sort of stuff using magic or like a spell is the same thing, really, you're just putting even more intention into it, right? So say you're doing something where it's like you want to do like a money magic spell or something, and you need like a green candle and you need to like maybe write, you know, some sort of in in inscribe something into the candle and maybe get a specific crystal, all of these things. You're spending all of this time and energy gathering all of these objects and stuff, right? So you're putting so much more intention into this ritual that you're going to do in order to bring this thing into your life, the thing that you want to have in your life. And so I just really saw those parallels. And there's so much beauty in that. And it's a very feminine thing, too. I feel like women in particular, we've, we kind of have like these romanticized ideas of like these fairy tales of, you know, like lore from back in the day. And I don't know. It just for for me, it just felt like something that was really beautiful. It's very artistic. I'm a very artistic person, and it was just something that I really wanted to incorporate not only into my life but kind of bring it out into the the mainstream. I mean, it makes so much sense. And and if there are people listening that don't uh, haven't been exposed to the secret or this idea of the laws of attraction, the best way I could sort of describe it quickly uh, before I ask Krista's a question because it's related to this is essentially. There's three, and look, there's a thousand ways that people talk about this. So I'm, I'm basically trying to distill it into a simple one. The three laws of attraction are like attracts like, nature abhors a vacuum, and the present is always perfect. Meaning whatever you're doing at that time is the right thing to be doing. So 
one of the most attractive things to me, and I think to a lot of people, is it allows for... First off, it allows people to be in the present, which anyone who's been listening to us or has spent any time delving into the idea of a mental health journey knows that the more time you can spend in the present, the more access you'll have to joy and the less you'll have anxiety about the future and be depressed about the past. Boom. We've talked about that. What I want to ask you about is this idea, because I loved you talking about this idea of like manifesting or like collecting of these things and then you know, bring it sort of into the world. And I wonder, you know, thinking about this idea of like nature abhorring a vacuum, which, and that's the other thing too, you say these three statements out loud, you know, people describe it as pseudoscience or things, but any of those statements taken in its own, 95% of people hear that and go, well, yeah, that just makes sense. Right. You know, so it isn't, it isn't like hugely controversial in that way, but I think what is a little bit more controversial is this power that you're talking about. This idea of like, when you collect these things, when you put, you use the word that, I love, which is the idea of intent. Are you being intentional? And and I think part of it for me is the moment you begin to be a little bit more intentional in your behavior and what you're trying to do, things generally go better because you're actually trying to accomplish the things that matter to you. So I think there is this like self-fulfilling prophecy that happens. But what I want to hear from you, because I can tell it's in there, is where do you think that power comes from? And you can talk about your own story of how you kind of dug yourself out of where you were and found the power in these things. And and I just, I. but by the way, you can tell I'm obviously a fan of this stuff, so I'm into it. So yeah, <laughs> I, want, I, want, I want to hear it from you, not from me. <laughs> I love it. Well, maybe I can give an example um, because I had a pretty powerful scenario happen when I first kind of got into this stuff. And it's interesting because it is such a paradigm shift if this isn't something that you're you know, normally into. For me, it was just like, okay, this seems crazy. Like magic really isn't real. Like this stuff is just, it, it can't be real. But I was like, you know what? I'm just going to try it, right? I was at a place in my life where I was struggling quite a bit. I mean, I had been most of my life up until this point. I struggled with a lot of health issues, um, you know, money things. It was back in my 20s. Like everything was just super friggin' dramatic. And, you know, like there was just all of these things that were happening all the time to me. And I had, you know, no control over it. And I guess my life is just always going to be shitty and dramatic. And I'm always going to be sick. Like it was very much that that was my vibe. For Which by very- the way, even the way you say that, it's like, well, yeah, if that's how your brain is working, of course yeah. it's not going to go well. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. Well, but everything from the external was telling me that. Right. So like my only experience up until that point was being sick constantly, like literally from birth, just having like chronic illness my whole entire life. And, you know, being told by Western medical doctors that, well, yeah, you are just very sick. And, you know, I was on eight prescriptions when I was like 22, which is insane, like absolutely insane. They're like, yeah, well, this is just who you are and you're just a sick person and whatever. And this was also reinforced by my family. Like, well, I don't know, sweetie, like, I guess you are just a sick person and this is just how it's always going to be. So there's the things that you're seeing from the external and it takes a whole lot of courage and a really big paradigm shift in order to change that. But I feel like kind of the way that it works is that when you decide to shift your perspective and take that leap of faith, you get like a really big reward or like there's something that happens that kind of proves to you that, okay, maybe this is the direction that I need to go in, or maybe there's something legitimate to this. So my story was that back, uh, it was over 10 years ago now, but I started out, I had an ad agency and (laughs) I was going through a particularly rough time. There was all this dramatic stuff happening, but there was this one client that I really wanted. This would have been like the biggest client that I would have ever got. and I really wanted to work with them and had pitched, done all of the things. And it was between myself and another agency and I didn't get the contract. And I was like, shit, right? And my usual go-to back then was like, oh my God, huge pity party. Like, I don't know, drink my my sorrows away, that sort of thing. But because it was around the time that I had, you know, watched The Secret on Netflix or whatever, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. And so in my mind, I just kind of convinced myself. I was like, okay, you know what? These guys are going to call me back. They're going to tell me that it didn't work out with the other agency and that they're going to hire me instead. And I just kind of said that over and over in my mind every single day for about two weeks. And then I got a call and verbatim, they said, Hey, Krista, it didn't work out with the other guys. We're going to hire you instead. And I was like, what the fuck just happened? (laughs) I was like, what? Like literally, I remember I was, I was 
my, my mom was upstairs at the time. You're like, what I kind of witch am I? And That's I just started like <laughs> freaking out. And I was like, mom, can you believe this shit just happened? And like, I told she was even like, she's not into this stuff at all. And she was like, That's pretty weird. And I was like, I know. I don't know what just happened. And I remember like it was just such a liberating feeling for me. And it was so exciting because I was like, oh my God, like maybe there's something to this. Like I'm going to totally change my entire life because of this experience. I remember I was at uh, this company was in another city. And so I had to drive there. And I remember just like going on this drive and just like kind of yelling out like to the universe, like, thank you, because it was just so inspiring. And it just felt like there's so much more to life than what we see every day. And it made me feel very empowered that I could actually, you know, change the circumstances of my life, which happened very dramatically after that, that point. And so I feel like, if you just test it out, you get rewarded. And that was just, for me, it was like, okay, like I can't deny that this isn't real. And that's kind of what got me started on that path there. Yeah, no, it's so cool. And and I love one of your quotes that I had seen, which was, you know, finding purpose saved my life. And it sounds like for you, this was the first real moment in your life where Things, or maybe you thought things were no longer happening to you, but things were happening for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really big one, and that was really hard to come to terms with for a very long time. And it and and it still is because there is a part of me (laughs) and the way that I'm built, or however however I decided to come in 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 this lifetime. And this might be really woo, -woo, but this is just how I am. So bear with me. (laughs) But I really feel like I'm I'm built with a lot of this karm like this karmic suffering around illness, right? And it's been extremely challenging. Obviously, (laughs) nobody wants to be sick all of the time. But that was something that needed to happen to me in order to come to these realizations to overcome a lot of these illnesses through natural healing, to be able to have that paradigm shift going from like Western medicine to all of these other healing modalities that actually work and can help people. And then I can talk about that. So I go through all of these things that are very difficult figure them out for myself, be able to share that information with other people and hopefully empower others in order to get themselves out of that situation. Because we're at a time on the planet right now where a lot of people are suffering with health issues, like a lot, a lot, a lot. And this type of information is just, it's extremely important. And yeah, and people need to start empowering themselves to take control of their own health because you can't, you can't put your, your health into the hands of, of other folks. That's interesting. We've had a lot of conversations lately, both on the podcast and outside of it, of the fact that, you know, the pandemic was essentially this global trauma that we've all gone through in our own way. And it has been resolved or unresolved to different steps and points for different people. I wonder, and, you know, we've talked a lot about some of the silver linings of kind of mental health and, you know, overall health and how the mind and the body interact, kind of coming to the forefront and, you know, talking about more somatic care and, and how all the pieces kind of fit into the whole. And I wonder from your perspective specifically, and, you know, obviously the work you're doing with others would be absolutely part and parcel to this, but, you know, we love hearing from your own perspective, too, because you do have a beautiful way of of relating it to your story. I just can't help but ask the question, looking at it, and when I say this, this is like a big question, is with everything that's going on in the world, right? It's a tough place to live right now. Everything seems to be hard to do. And why or how do you think it's coming to the forefront, even for someone like you to be like, all right, you want to feel a little power in your life? You want to feel like you're taking a little more control? It's not that hard, but you have to do something. And it seems like that's the thing, right? That's the switch, right? And Eric sort of alluded to this in his first question to you of like, you know, how did you make that change? Because it wasn't just external. You didn't just have that thought. And then the thing, the positive thing happened. I know it's a beautiful story, but there was more to it than that. There there had to have been just knowing and listening to how you talk about it. So what were some of the breadcrumbs along the way or things that you started to realize as you had these different successes, as you felt better? I mean, which I mean, of course, is amazing. You know, what kind of showed up for you? You know, where are these like little aha moments along the way that kind of led you to that? Well, it was really just kind of surrendering and and like what you mentioned with breadcrumbs. Right. So learning to trust my intuition. Right. So I think a lot of it is just like, okay, what do I really want in my life? Right. So there's like that whole exercise of, okay, if 
if there's a lot more possibility in this lifetime <laughs> than I could have ever imagined, like if this one thing that I did turned out to be, you know, so fantastic, what else can be possible? And it just allowed me to think a lot bigger. Within a few months of that initial circumstance that I had mentioned, I had literally just sold my business. I packed up everything that I owned and I ended up moving to Malaysia to work for a company called Mind Valley. So I went from a place where I was sick all the time. I didn't feel like I would ever be able to live the lifestyle that I was six months later to that circumstance because I felt that I was bedridden, that I couldn't do all of these things. But there was such a dramatic change that it changed just the way that I thought about everything. And I was like, well, why can't I go and move to the other side of the planet and go work <laughs> for this really cool company and all this stuff, right? So it just like totally changed my entire life. And it really was. It's just finding your inspiration, like figuring out what that is. The purpose piece is extremely important too. So if you can figure out like what your gifts are, what you're meant to do, like for me, a lot of it has to do with beauty. I'm like, I'm a designer, right? So like I make beautiful things. I make people look great. I design all of these things, whether it's like products or, you know, brands, those types of things. That's what I really love to focus on. I mean, even spaces. And so I knew that that was my gift. And now where can I make the biggest impact? And for me at that time, it was like, well, you know, this other company is doing such great work and elevating consciousness. And, you know, they have such a great impact. I want to lend my skills towards that. And so that's kind of where that had led me at, at that point. And that's always going to shift for me. You know, I get itchy feet every couple of years and I totally blow up my life and I got to do something else. I'm at that point again right now. <laughs> You know what? I think I need to move to Costa Rica. I don't know. So, someone else is calling me. La, la Pura Vida. The point you bring up, I think, is really important because I, I'll be honest, kind of revealing my own thing. I've gone through a really big life shift recently, and, and I think I have a more keen understanding of like what I should be doing and why, but I'm not necessarily doing it. And mm. I think it's an important thing to not crush yourself for that. And I feel like, because, and this isn't a criticism what you said, Krista, I don't mean it that way at all, but you lay that thing out there. It's like, yeah, once you find your purpose and inspiration, everything will be fine. But then you just said, well, then two years later, I'm like, well, I want to do something else now. That is okay, right? And it is okay to sort of float in the ether for a minute. And I think there's a freedom and a challenge in that opportunity that's really unsettling. Like I find it in myself. Like somebody said to me the other day, are you doing what you really want? And I'm like, I mean, every minute of every day, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, yeah. and if you, Eric and, and Krista just saw my face and it is, it's like, that's almost paralyzing. It's like, don't do that to yourself. Mm -hmm. But, but the message that you give there that Krista, that's so wonderful is just make sure that there's some piece of that central thing that makes you, you, that is a part of it, right? Whether it's me sitting here on this podcast with two beautiful people talking about the beauty that's in the world versus on. Yeah, you actually are a beautiful person. I don't like to look at you, but I like to talk <laughs> at you. Beauty comes in a lot of different ways, Eric. I know. <laughs> Sorry, Krista, that's how we talk to each other. <laughs> but there is a sense. This is going to sound crazy. By the way, I'm the cynic. And it's funny in this episode because yes. I, I usually am. But there is a beauty to me in those moments of realization of like, oh, I don't know but that's okay. And I, I don't think we give ourselves, and I say ourselves, like societally, personally, we all like, Krista, even for you, like, you're like, all right, you know, here I am. I've got this great job. Everything's going great. And, but is it everything? No, it doesn't have to be, but you also don't have to be everything every moment of every day. And there's something in that like balance and that interplay that I think is so hard for us as humans to even like, get. And I think part of it is this idea of like just being present in the moment and, and enjoying it for what it is and, and being there and not worrying about what's next or what you just did. Even me who just made that statement is like, wait, is that what I meant? You know? And, and like, that's how our brain works. I wonder, you know, looking at it, like, and you even just said it, you're like, here I am again. I've got a, this little bit of itchy feet, this wanderlust of like, what's next? How do you kind of guide yourself or allow yourself to move into that? Because sometimes for me, I'm like, oh, I'm just following the path of least resistance. And from the outside, people are like, no, you're like pushing the boundaries and becoming a little bit more or different of what you already are. And I'm like, yeah, well, that opportunity just landed in my lap. So I went for it. And it's like, those two things don't necessarily equate. They're not the same. 
Mm -hmm. even, even if it feels that way, right? Like, I'm sure the job, you know, you're like, oh, I'm just going to do this now. This seems like a great opportunity. So from the outside, it's like, oh, Chris is doing this other thing where inside you're like, I don't know. It just, it seemed cool. So I did it. You know, it's like, how do we balance that out in our brains? Uh, oh my gosh. Well, I mean, we live in duality and nothing ever stays the same. And you're right. It's not just like, oh, hey, I found purpose and now my life is great. Like, it's not like that at all. Like, my life is a friggin' roller coaster. Like, <laughs> I got like a lot of emotions going on. I have, you know, little menti bees all the time. Like there's just, you know, it's just, there's a lot of up and down, which is natural, right? And those low points are actually, <laughs> there's a lot of medicine in them. Yeah. Um. So for myself, actually for the past few months, it's been, the, the energy has been really heavy for me. And I know that when this happens, there's a big change coming, right? I've just experienced it enough times now that I'm like, okay, like I really, really, really hate this so the spot I, this I part that. sucks but i gotta do it <laughs> yeah but you gotta do it right and you know find the lessons in being uncomfortable and it always transforms into something else like literally just this morning i woke up and i was like oh, okay i think i know what to do like it's been months of like Ugh, i'm really uncomfortable i'm not happy where i am right now i'm feeling like i just i can't be in the space anymore i don't know where to go i don't know what to do and it was just like a lot of feeling lost and just, yeah, just, just a lot of uncomfortability. Right. But if you can just sit with that and just allow it to kind of move through you, you know, you will start to get like these little bits of inspiration and things that come through. And for me, it's always like, okay, I just kind of have to wade through this for a while, do whatever, you know, mental health work or whatever it is in order just to kind of get myself to a place where I'm moving through these uncomfortable spots with as much grace <laughs> as I can. <laughs> but I mean, nobody's perfect, but let's be honest. There's well, and I think the important thing is I'm, I'm going to ask this, Krista, <laughs> by grace, you don't mean from the outside, you mean to yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I think that's yeah. an important distinction. I just, I could tell that that's what you meant, but I think, because mm -hmm. sometimes we do get too concerned with how it looks from the outside, right? No one wants to look like the fuck up in the corner. Yeah. Although sometimes I'll be honest, I really don't care. And, and like, I don't like I, people are like, what's going on over there? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> so yeah. look, I'm an answer person. So that's really hard for me to say, but mm -hmm. like in my heart of hearts, sometimes I'm like, yeah, I don't know. It's a mess. But what's really cool yeah. is what, what Chris is just talking about and, and experiencing pretty much is not the same because it's fingerprints, right? It's no one has the same similar, similar, similar to what my experience was last fall into the winter. And it was, you know, you know, Mark and Amy and um, not many other people, but it's been it, it's becoming a bit of a, a seismic change for me in the direction that I'm headed in and and what I'm doing and 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 kind of where I'm going. And, and one of the things I was really curious about, Krista, because you brought up that word intuition and the third eye. And so I've done a lot of work with my energy healer. And one of the interesting conversations we had, and I'm wondering if it manifested in a similar way for you. So she and I talked a lot about how I needed to trust my intuition more. And we started to go back and look at my prior career to moving out here to Colorado. And in many ways, even though I had this, I had this facade, you know, I was hiding all of my my mental health struggles from the world. I always used to think, well, how do how do I get this job done every day? And how am I successful? And, what's, and she said, it's your intuition. She's like, essentially, you know, your mind was racing and spinning and anxiety and OCD and all these things were happening, but you were able to just trust your intuition when you went in every day. And the decisions that you made were based on things that you felt were right. And you went with it at the time. And she's like, and now you just have to kind of trust yourself and use that intuition now that you're even more aware of it. And so I'm curious, was it a similar thing for you, even when you were going through your health struggles and your mental health struggles? Was there a, a time where you may not have even realized that your intuition was sort of helping to guide you and, and run your life before you became you know, so aware of that being such a powerful force for you? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I mean, I spent you know, a big chunk of my life completely ignoring my intuition, <laughs> which I think a lot of us do. Right? And, and wondering why you didn't feel good. 
Yeah, well, exactly. Right. <laughs> we let the mind and the ego and all of these things get in the way. You know, we stay in that unfulfilling relationship for too long when we have like this gut feeling or like this. For me, it's always a voice screaming, being like, <laughs> yep. okay, you got to get out of here. This is not the place for you. Or, you know, it could be like, hey, you really need to stop self sabotaging. Like you're feeling like shit all the time. Maybe you shouldn't be partying so much, you know, all of these different things. But the thing is, is like, we need to learn to pay attention to that, right? So like when you're getting these gut feelings that, or, you know, like these thoughts that are kind of screaming in the back of your mind, instead of like shoving that under the rug, it's like, okay, maybe I need to do something about this. And it's not always the most comfortable thing, right? It can be totally blowing up your life, but that's the direction that you need to go in. And what I found is that when I consistently ignore that voice, the universe steps in with the big guns and you're not going to like what happens at that point. (laughs) I've had scenarios where I've stayed in relationships for too long. For an example, I had an ex who literally just like, I was out of town. He snuck home while I was gone, packed up all the shit, ran off and I never saw him again. The universe was just like, okay, well, you didn't pay attention. So now he is just leaving your life completely, never going to see him again. And I was like, oh, okay. That was quite the lesson. That was pretty aggressive. But I had ample opportunity to, you know, not self-abandon, stand up for myself and do what I should have done along the way. But I kept, you know, shoving it under the rug because of issues of not feeling worthy enough or this is the only thing that I'm ever going to be, you know, this is the only thing I'm ever going to get. And so I just, I, I need to stick it out. I've also had other circumstances too, where like a move needed to happen, but I wasn't listening. And I was like, no, you know, actually... That one was kind of annoying because I feel like I didn't get too many flags regarding that one, but I ended up getting like a very swift kick in the ass. To, well, to but I, I, the that. thing that's important is sometimes it's, you know, it takes two to tango, so to speak. So you may have only gotten a couple of flags, but the flags on the other side. And I think that's where it, it becomes interesting to untangle, right? Like it's hard enough listening to what's going on in your own life. But then, you know, Eric and I have both been married for a long time. I, I just celebrated my 20th anniversary. He just celebrated his 25th. And we are very lucky. We have amazing partners and we try to be the most amazing partners we can to them. But there are times where you're just like, I don't know what the hell is going on with you. Forget what's going on with me. I, don't, I mean, you know, and then, <laughs> so I, I think... It's hard because you're even still post this. You're like, well, I mean, I guess I miss some things, but it's like, no, it isn't always just you, but you're right. Like there are road markers along the way that when we get caught up in all these other things, it's too easy to miss, I think would be Mm -hmm. how I would sort of paraphrase that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I mean, in this circumstance, like I knew, I knew things were good, right? <laughs> and I was just like, no, nope, just going to ignore that. Just going to ignore that. And then the universe was like, okay, bitch, like, let's <laughs> I love it. I'm, I'm yeah. trying to give you the soft yeah. landing. And you're like, nope. Well, yeah, you know, nope. Is, no, no. <laughs> but the interesting thing I about deserve that, it. <laughs> the interesting thing about that, the relationship story though, is your intuition was telling you for a while. And, and essentially your, your intuition, the way I see it is, kind of a de facto way of allowing you to do it on your terms, right? Like yeah. you could have, you could have yeah. left, you could have packed up, you could have, mm-hmm. and you're like, no, 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 no. And then the universe is basically like, you have no choice. We're ripping the bandaid off and whatever emotions are going to come out now, because you didn't choose to do it on your own terms. And now you're going to have to sit with it and deal with it and move through it. Yep. Yep. <laughs> And boy, did I ever, but I mean, that was what I needed at that time, right? I needed to go through that, that process of, you know, (laughs) excavating a a trauma. Like sometimes when we go through a really traumatic situation like that, it brings up all kinds of stuff. So that in itself was a really major healing process for me. It took about a year and a half, actually. So it was, yeah, a lot of lessons through, through that process. I didn't like it. (laughs) Right, It seems to be like a pretty big theme in my life. Like I keep getting these things that, you know, are quite challenging, but it's like, you got to go through those really, really dark night of the soul processes in order to, you know, get all of the wisdom and the healing from that. I'm stealing that quote, by the way, excavating a trauma. Like it is, or it's almost more like an archaeological dig, right? Because you don't want to get in there with like, you know, a digging machine and just like break through everything. You kind of want to like dust it aside with the little broom and like, you know, get the thing out there. And, but unfortunately, no, but some, sometimes think, the world brings the digger in and just throws yeah. it right in the middle. And you're like, whoa, 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 I'm not ready for that. <laughs> but what I do like is the combination of the two, because in some ways, and I'm thinking about the dig that took place here in Snowmass, right? Like 
unintentionally like the excavator goes in and you kind of pull back a whole bunch of the earth and you're like ooh what is what, what's that? I think I see something over there. And you're like, okay, so now I need to move the excavator out of the way. And I have to come in with like some smaller tools. And I have to see if that's actually something that's, you know, is it a dinosaur? Is like, how long is that? And then you start uncovering it more and you're like, oh, wow, this is an unbelievable find. Right. And then you spend all that time. And then, you know, the toothbrushes come in and the, you right. And, and finally you excavate this thing and remove this thing. Thing that in our case, you know, may have been buried for decades mm-hmm. and you never knew even existed or resided there. Mm-hmm. I literally just had this conversation on our new podcast uh, with a relationship expert. And we talked about this exact thing, right? Healing through grief. And generally what will happen with like a big trauma is that a lot of unresolved things that you have dug like way down, way down deep will come out. And then you have like a whole, whole mess that you need to deal with that you're faced with. That's actually, it's it's extremely common. So I want to move into the magic of the magic maven. And let's talk about the chaga mushroom. Okay. <laughs> Because I know this has been such a huge part of your healing journey, what you know, Wild Remedies does. And I don't think, you know, we've talked about a lot about alternative medicine treatments and plant-based medicines and things on our show, but I don't think we've ever actually talked specifically about, right, Mark, I'm looking at your face. You're the expert on the- uh, No, I, yeah, I mean, I know, of, I know what a chaga is. There's actually a yeah. couple of very out there products that have chaga as an ingredient now. Yes. But yeah, it's, we've never talked about it because it isn't- no. Um, We've talked a lot about plants that cause, I guess, a more sudden uh, uh, psychological shift versus, Mm -hmm. um, and I might be wrong, but I believe Chaga's biggest thing is it actually has major anti-inflammatory properties, right? I mean, I know it has other stuff too, but isn't that one of the big things? Immunomodulating. Ah, okay. Yep. Yeah, yes. Yeah. yeah. It's an adaptogen, so it can work in lots of different ways, but yeah, the biggest thing is is working on the immune system. Yeah. But no, I'm excited. So I'm... But- yeah. Let's hear it all about the chaga mushroom. Chaga, the 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 saga, really, in, in my life. Well, chaga was really re- responsible for me starting the business several years ago. So I was living overseas in Malaysia at the time, working for that, that company, and I was starting to get that itch. And I was like, hmm, I don't really want to be here anymore. I'd founded another startup while I was there, which was, you know, kind of running its term at that point. And I started feeling inspired that I wanted to create a product of my own of some sort. I wasn't really sure what that looked like yet. So I had ended up going back to Canada for a couple of months during the summer. And my old business partner reached out to me and she said, Hey, there's this guy that I've been working with. He's got this really cool product. He needs some help with design. Like, do you want to have a chat with him? And I was like, sure. So I go for coffee with this guy And he is brewing this chaga mushroom tea. And I had never heard of chaga at this point, which I thought was really strange because I was into like all the wellness stuff at that point. And I was like, okay. So he's explaining to me all of the health benefits and like, he's going deep. Like, he's just like, this stuff cures cancer. Like it's like highest source of antioxidants on the planet, all this stuff. And I was like, okay, like interesting. You know, I thought it was really cool. And I was like, okay, well, I'm going to look into this. So that was kind of like my, my my introduction to Chaga. Two days later, I'm at a friend's house and we're doing mushrooms of another variety. That <laughs> and uh, Not sauteed mushrooms. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. These ones are more fun. But she brought you can up cook Chaga. Them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So she brought it up. Yeah. So she brings she brings up chaga and she's like oh yeah like the first nations have been using this medicine for you know like thousands of years or whatever and i was like that's so strange like i just somebody just mentioned this the other day and i was like okay and so these are the kind of pings that i get like this stuff happens to me all the time in my life right these are the things that i follow so this is an example of what that looks like but this was pretty intense because again (laughs) within the same week like seriously just a couple of days later i decided to go to this area. It's about 45 minutes outside of my hometown and it's called the center of the universe. So the story of this place is that back in the seventies, an apprentice monk from San Francisco showed up to this spot 
in Canada, up on this mountain, it's called Dead Man's Creek. The area is called Vidette Lake. And he did a bunch of energetic tests and deemed it the center of the universe for like Buddhism or something. I don't know. Anyway, it's become a total like, I guess, like a spiritual hub. People come from all over the world to do meditation retreats and all of these things. So I'd heard about it before I had moved uh, to Malaysia and was like, oh, I got to go check this place out. So I decided to go and I brought my parents with me, which was really strange. But anyway, so we all go up to this place and we're greeted by the gentleman that owns the property. He takes us on a tour and, you know, we're grounding and water witching and, you know, meditating all these things. And he kind of starts, you know, showing us stuff that you can eat in the forest and he's grabbing some moss and all these things. And he stops and he looks at me and he's like, you've ever heard of chaga? And I was like, okay. Okay. That's three. <laughs> that's three. <laughs> and I'm in the, the center of the friggin' universe. Like I, yep. I got it. I got it. Okay. <laughs> So I was like, well, okay, clearly this is something that I need to look into. You're like, let's do this. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I didn't really have a choice, right? I really feel like, and, and that's another reason that, you know, we have the word magic and in, in, in the business and all the products and stuff too. It's like, this really does feel like a divinely guided thing that I was supposed to do. So I get back to Malaysia and I start testing out all of the different types of this mushroom, right? So I'm learning about it. Back then it was like, you know, Four Sigmatic was just kind of a new company, right? I think they had like 2,500 followers on Instagram or whatever now, and they're doing like 80 million in sales a year or something at this point. So they were the ones that kind of like introduced medicinal mushrooms to the West. And it was a very new thing at that point. So I'm testing it out. I'm trying all of these different forms of extracts and, you know, like the actual mushroom and different ways that that, that you use it. And I found for me, because I was still at a stage of my healing journey where my immune system was trash. So like I was getting sick all the time. I traveled a ton every single time I got on a plane, every single time I got sick because you're basically just like in a tube of germs, right? And so if your immune system isn't that great for me, now I realize the immune system was very weak because of gut health. So a lot, like, I think it's like 80, 70% of our immune system or something resides in our gut. And from many, 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 many years of taking antibiotics from the myriad of throat infections that I had throughout my childhood, my guts were a mess. And I, I, I didn't realize that. So this was before I went on my gut healing journey. And even in that state, I found that taking chaga every day, you know, in a tea or in my coffee, I didn't get sick all the time anymore. And like, I could literally be around sick people and not get sick. And I was like, okay, well, there's clearly something here. So I started making my own tea and I used to hand make my tea in my kitchen in Malaysia. I launched it at the Bali Spirit Festival, which was a bit of a fiasco. I almost got thrown in jail because I didn't think that there was an issue putting, you know, like, I don't know, 50 pounds of mushroom powder in tins in my friggin' carry on and like bringing it into Indonesia. I, was like, <laughs> <laughs> I literally, I didn't even like, I didn't even figure it out until I was on the plane and I was like, oh, wait. This might have not have been the best idea. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Why did I think of this before? I should have just FedEx this shit over. Yep. Anyway, universe guided me along. It was like, okay, it's not your time for jail. Like, let's just, let's, let's just keep this moving. But yeah, it's That's just. That's a been, lot of mushroom powder. <laughs> it was a lot. It was a lot of mushroom powder. Yeah. Oh my God. I remember the guard. Like, so he grabbed I'm one sure. The they're like, what the hell is this? Well, yeah, right. So he like he opens up one of my little tins and all this brown powder comes <laughs> flying out, right? And I'm like, hmm. that doesn't it's look drugs. It's <laughs> not drugs. It's just tea. And he's just like, yeah, he stared me down really hard. I thought I thought my life was over for for a few minutes there, but yeah. It's... So that like that that's how everything sort of started, right? And I kind of went on this journey of like you know trying to get this product off the ground, not really knowing what I'm doing. And yeah, fast forward a few years later, and now we have this beautiful collection of other products. Not all of our products have mushrooms in them, just our spiced chocolate, but it has the, the same amazing wild Siberian chaga mushroom extract that I used in, in the first tea, which is the best quality stuff that I've been able to find. And now here you are. So we talked earlier, I think you were on eight medications. Mm -hmm. How many medications are you on now? Yeah. And honestly, and that that's pretty recent. Like it's it still took me a long time to get off of. So I was on 
oh God, I don't know, like two or three antidepressants. And there was one in particular that was just really difficult to, to get off of. And I didn't feel like I was getting any, you know, negative effects from it, but it was just like an, like, I was just like, I, I can't just be on medication forever. I need to figure out a way to get off of this. And recently I've been working with more energy healers and intuitives to support my healing journey, which is a little bit different for me. Like I, I've, I've worked with those types of people in the past, but I was kind of relying on a lot of like naturopathic things, which for me actually wasn't as powerful. What I've been doing recently is working with intuitive people who have kind of been guiding me in a way where I'm learning to use my intuition even more. And so there were a couple of medications that I was still on that I've gone off of recently with literally zero effects. I did have a little change in my body. So there was like a little blood pressure thing that I was still dealing with, but I managed to intuitively um, find a tincture that is just herbs that literally just kind of cured that, that, that last thing for me. So yeah, it's been... I don't know, something that I've never experienced before, but it's worked amazingly for me. And yeah, zero medications now. It's great. That is amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I want to make sure everyone knows where to find you and to find these products. So if you could let us yeah. know where to find you on the internets and all that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you can find our products on our website at wildremediesshop.com. You can connect with us on Instagram. Our handle is wild underscore remedies. We also just launched a podcast. It's called the Wild Remedies Podcast. Uh, I think like our fourth episode is dropping this week. Uh, we got some really cool guests uh, coming up as well. And we talk a lot about wild remedies of all sorts, right? So whether we're talking about mental health or breath work or, you know, plant medicine, there's kind of like this whole spectrum of, of wellness that we discuss, but it's, it's a little bit edgy. So um, it's a fun place to be if anybody wants to come catch us over there. Sounds great. Yeah. And I'll be honest, like I'm an asthma sufferer. Krista, if I'm speaking for you out of line, we're not saying that you, you just eat some mushrooms and throw all the shit away. Like that's not what Krista no, did. No, 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 <laughs> right? no. Like <laughs> years to get off this stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> no. it's one of those things that I'll be honest, and maybe it's the universe talking to me. I have had some thoughts recently of like, okay, I've been taking these steroids and these different things. And it's like, I know there are other ways to work through this. And it's actually where... I had heard about Chaga. I, I have a friend who's actually uh, a PhD nurse practitioner and stuff, and her big thing is all about inflammation. Um, mm -hmm. And it's funny because we don't necessarily always put this together, but uh, the immune response is inflammation. It's why we get fevers. It's why we yep. swell up when things yep. hurt. And so it was one of the things where I was actually chatting with her about it. And she said, she's like, look, she's like, your asthma is an inflammatory response. She's like, and there are a thousand ways it can happen. I know you don't necessarily take an anti-anxiety. She's like, but you know, you have some anxiety. She's like, that can do it. She's like, you know, kind of untangling it. And I guess the biggest thing I'm taking from the conversation from you is just give it a shot. It's, will, you know, like, what's it going to hurt you? Like, what, what is one of your tea products? I'm, you know, at the most, it's probably, what, 20 or $30? Yeah, 35 bucks. There you go. So the most expensive one, $35. Yeah. Like, you mm -hmm. know, that's that's a dinner and a beer out, you know? And it's like, that tea may be way better for you than that burger and beer. Um, so give it a shot. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, like, you know, I'm not claiming that our products cure anything. We really need to take a holistic approach to our wellness. Um, but what you're talking about there and a thing that I really love to, to, to talk about all the time is gut health, right? So this inflammation that you're talking about. So for me, when I was struggling with horrific depression and panic attacks and all of these things, I'd mentioned that I'd taken a lot of antibiotics as a kid, right? Which destroys your gut. Okay. Yep. Our serotonin is in our gut, like all of these different things. So our mental health, all of these things are affected when our gut is disturbed and the shit that we have in our food right now right? The, the, the glyphosate that's on all of our vegetables, the antibiotics that are in the meat that we eat, all of this stuff is continuing to destroy our gut. And there's lots of things that we can do to reverse that. It does take some time, but I mean like bone broths, you know, um, aloe, all of these different things, trying to eat as organic as, as humanly possible. I know it's extremely difficult, but I've made like huge strides in that. Also eliminating gluten has been a massive thing for me. Literally got rid of my, my depression, just getting rid of gluten out of my diet, which is wild. And then of course, 
you know, having healthy options. That's really the most important thing. And like why I wanted to create these products is to have something that not only tastes good, right? Because there's a lot of health products out there. They don't always taste good. These taste really wonderful. They have supplement grade ingredients in them. And it is a healthy alternative, like it's a healthier alternative than what a lot of people are currently ingesting, right? And so like, we just need to make these tweaks. It's not like we need to like eliminate absolutely everything, but we just need to kind of move our eating habits into something that is like more high vibe and something that's going to support us rather than hinder us and continue to degrade our health. A few episodes back, we had Todd Knight Holm on and he's a somatic therapist. And I actually, I had the opportunity to have dinner with him when I was racing up in Wyoming three weekends ago. And we had a follow on conversation to what we were chatting about on the podcast about biome and serotonin and gut health and, you know, the impact not only uh, for mental health, but then we were talking about, you know, athletic performance and things like that, which was, was really interesting. Um, And now to hear you, Krista, talk about it um, through your own lived experience, especially, you know, so when you combine childhood trauma that you may or may not even be aware of uh, related to, you know, your health issues, but then a very high dose for a very long time of antibiotics, which is essentially killing, right? All of the biome in your gut. And so here you are severe, severe depression, which most doctors would not even uh, on the Western side would not even draw that link to the medication you were taking. And um, so it really is a lived case in you do have to be your own advocate and you do have to be your own best, let's call it like investigative journalist uh, and using all of these different modalities, putting the puzzle pieces together uh, Mm -hmm. and finding out what works you know, for you, it'll it'll be something slightly different for me. It'll be something slightly different for Mark. But what I'm hoping our audience can take away from this is, again, that whole idea of there is no absolute right way to go about your healing journey. Uh, And it's a lot of experimentation. It's a lot of trying different things and speaking to lots of different people. And in your case, uh, going from eight medications to zero, which is like, you know, as, as you were talking, I was like, oh, wow, you know, my three medications, like I'd love to be able to take those down to zero over time as well. And it's just such a great story. And, and I really, I thank you for sharing that. I'm going to try Chaga for a whole host of reasons. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, thank my quote unquote shitty karma, you know, (laughs) put me in all of these like terrible situations over my life in order to overcome them and then share my story. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) And Krista, I'm going to get him to try those other mushrooms too. (laughs) Oh, you haven't already. Like, you you gotta get, gotta get on that. <laughs> That's fabulous. I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for sharing. Liz, you just put my own shitty karma that led me to this place. And <laughs> and and look, it's unfortunately it's not so different than anything. I was asked for a title of an episode. It is. You should. <laughs> That's because I mean, I'll be honest. Eric, that's why Eric and I are here, right? We just, we wish mm-hmm. it was easier for people to talk about this stuff. We want people to talk about it. And and look, life is so much better and there's so much more capacity for health and joy if we're not sitting in the corner hiding how much we either hurt or don't feel well. I don't know how else to do it except by sharing our story, sharing your story. And I um, can't thank you enough, truly. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to know you and hear all this. And thank you for sharing it with our listeners. Eric, anything else? Although you just did a pretty good wrap up. So I don't know why I'm even asking you. <laughs> I, I know. As you were... <laughs> As you were talking, I was just, I was thinking of what Krista said. And, you know, I was thinking of another amazing Canadian musician, Avril Lavigne. And, you know, she talks about like, you know, so much for my happy ending. And all of a sudden I was looking at the guitars, right. And I played last night and in my own head, I was thinking like, starting to think of the lyrics to like, thank you for my shitty karma. Like, along with the Avril Lavigne, like, track running in my brain. So <laughs> so there might be oh, a recording coming your way, Krista. We so might write some I love it. I, yeah. I, I can kind of sing. So, like, if you ever want to collab on something like that, I'd be down. Oh, totally. <laughs> we could drop the guitar tracks. 
And, and, well, and it's funny because I've actually I keep noticing my original, so the piece of crap. It's of all those guitars, it's the Speaking one that doesn't. Shitty karma, yeah. It doesn't belong there, but because I played some of my first live gigs, I can't get rid of it. It's there, um, and that's in an open tuning. And I was thinking about like shitty karma. Sounds like a blues song. I'm like, that thing's an open D. Maybe I should pull the slide out. <laughs> and and then all of a sudden you're like lyrics and it's like, so here it is. Like that's yeah. that's what we're talking about. The we can, and we can, you. we can recreate it because you played that open D with the slide on our intro yeah, and outro our music that intro, we wrote. Yeah. And I can bring the telly over. And yeah, I <laughs> I'm hearing a song. Maybe we can create it for the track for your uh, podcast Chris. yeah we could yeah we could switch it up that's how mark and i that's oh, how God. that's how mark and i got around any copyright issues with music we just wrote our own intro and outro and played it okay i'm so into that <laughs> <laughs> oh no <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny. And I, I've actually been playing a bit a fair bit more and like tinkering and I was like, Oh, like I haven't written anything in a while and I started playing I always have segments, right? I literally have these song segments that I've been tinkering with playing different licks and things. So yeah, there's yeah. there's plenty of stuff in the hopper we could shape. Yeah, and like a lot of B7 chords and D minor, like a lot of that like eerie, Halloween y, like magic y. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> minor seventh and major seventh yes yeah all right we gotta do it you gotta come over come to the studio um i'm into it i love it i love it krista krista francoeur thank you so much this is mark fernandes and i want to thank krista of course and my co-host eric DeRosa. this was episode 87 and with that i will leave us with these words as i always do let's all please be as well as we can Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe to our show and leave us a review. Also, we'd love if you could share this episode with a friend and encourage you to connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, or email via the links in our show notes. See you next week.